Chapter Four of the Carved Lions by Mrs. Molesworth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Four, all settled. That Sunday, that last Sunday, I somehow feel inclined to call it, stands out in my memory quite differently from its fellows. Both Haddie and I had felt dull and depressed, partly owing, no doubt, to the weather but still more, I think, from that vague fear of something being wrong which we were both suffering from, though we would not speak of it to each other. It cleared up a little in the evening, and though it was cold and chilly, we went to church. Mamma had said to us we might, if we liked, and Lydia was going. When we came in, Cook sent us a little supper, which we were very glad of. It cheered us up. "'Aren't you thankful they're coming home tomorrow? I said to Haddie. "'I've never minded their being away so much before. "'They had been away two or three times that we could remember, "'though never for longer than a day or two. "'Yes,' said Haddie, "'I'm very glad.' "'But that was all he said. "'They did come back the next day, pretty early in the morning, "'as father had to be at the bank. "'He went straight there from the railway station, "'and Mamma drove home with the luggage.' She was very particular, when she went to stay with her godmother, to take nice dresses, for Mrs. Selwood would not have been pleased to see her looking shabby, and it would not have made her any more sympathising or anxious to help, but rather the other way. Long afterwards, at least some years afterwards, when I was old enough to understand— I remember Mrs. Selwood saying to me that it was Mamma's courage and good management which made everybody respect her. I was watching at the dining-room window which looked out to the street when the cab drove up. After the heavy rain the day before, it was for once a fine day with some sunshine, and sunshine was rare at Great Mexington, especially in late November. Mamma was looking out to catch the first glimpse of me, of course she knew that my brother would be at school. There was a sort of sunshine on her face, at least I thought so at first, for she was smiling. But when I looked more closely, there was something in the smile which gave me a queer feeling, startling me almost more than if I had seen that she was crying. I think for my age I had a good deal of self-control of a certain kind. I waited till she had come in and kissed me, and sent away the cab, and we were alone. Then I shut the door and drew her to father's special armchair beside the fire. "'Mamma, dear,' I half said, half whispered, "'what is it?' Mamma gave a sort of gasp or choke before she answered. Then she said, "'Why, dear, why should you think, oh, I don't know what I'm saying?' And she tried to laugh, but I wouldn't let her. "'It's something in your face, Mamma," I persisted. She was silent for a moment. "'We had meant to tell you and Haddie this evening,' she said, "'father and I together. "'But perhaps it is better. "'Yes, my Geraldine, there is something. "'Till now it was not quite certain, "'though it has been hanging over us for some weeks ever since. "'Since that day I asked you, "'the morning after father came home so late and you had been crying. "'Yes, since then,' said Mamma. She put her arm round me, and then she told me all that I have told already, or at least as much of it as she thought I could understand. She told it quietly, but she did not try not to cry. The tears just came trickling down her face, and she wiped them away now and then. I think the letting them come made her able to speak more calmly. And I listened. I was very sorry for her, very, very sorry. But you may think it strange— I've often looked back upon it with wonder myself, though I now feel as if I understood the causes of it better when I tell you that I was not fearfully upset or distressed myself. I did not feel inclined to cry, except out of pity for Mamma, and I listened with the most intense interest and even curiosity. I was all wound up by excitement, for this was the first great event I had ever known the first change in my quiet child life. And my excitement grew even greater when Mamma came to the subject of what was decided about us children. Haddie, of course, must go to school, she said, to a larger and better school. Mrs. Selwood speaks of rugby, 
if it can be managed. He will be happy there, every one says. But about you, my Geraldine. Oh, Mamma, I interrupted, do let me go to school, too. I've always wanted to go, you know, and except for being away from you, I would far rather be a boarder. It's really being at school, then. I know they rather look down upon day scholars, Hattie says so. Mamma looked at me gravely. Perhaps she was just a little disappointed, even though, on the other hand, she may have felt relieved, too, at my taking the idea of this separation, which to her overrode everything, which made the next two years a black cloud to her, so very philosophically. But she sighed. I fancy a suspicion of the truth came to her almost at once, and added to her anxiety the truth that I did not the least realise what was before me. "'We are thinking of sending you to school, my child,' she said, quietly, "'and of course it must be a boarder. Mrs. Selwood advises Miss Ledbury's school here. She has known the old lady long, and has a very high opinion of her, and it is not very far from Fernley, in case Miss Ledbury wishes to consult Mrs. Selwood about you in any way, or in case you are ill. I am very glad, I said, I should like to go to Miss Ledbury's. My fancy had been tickled by seeing the girls at her school walking out, two and two in orthodox fashion. I thought it must be delightful to march along in a row like that, and to have a partner of your own size to talk to as much as you liked. Mamma said no more just then. I think she felt at a loss what to say. She was afraid of making me unnecessarily unhappy, and on the other hand she dreaded my finding the reality all the worse when I came to contrast it with my rose-coloured visions. She consulted father, and he decided it was best to leave me to myself and my own thoughts. She is a very young child still, he said to Mamma. All this, of course, I was told afterwards. It is quite possible that she will not suffer from the separation, as we have feared. It may be much easier for her than if she had been two or three years older. Had he had no illusions, from the very first he took it all in, and that very bitterly. He was, as I have said, a very good boy, and a boy with a great deal of resolution and firmness. He said nothing to discourage me. Mamma told him how surprised she was at my way of taking it, and he agreed with father that perhaps I would not be really unhappy. And I do think that my chief unhappiness during the next few weeks came from the sight of dear Mamma's pale, worn face, which she could not hide, try as she might to be bright and cheerful. There was, of course, a great deal of bustle and preparation, and all children enjoy that, I fancy. Even Haddie was interested about his school outfit. He was to go to a preparatory school at Rugby till he could get into the big school, and as far as school went, he told me he was sure he would like it very well. It was only the... but there he stopped. The what? I asked. Oh, the being all separated, he said gruffly. But you'd have to go away to a big school some day, I reminded him. You didn't want always to go to a day school. No, he allowed. But it's the holidays. The holidays? I had not thought about that part of it. Oh, I dare say something nice will be settled for the holidays, I said lightly. In one way, Haddie was very lucky. Mrs. Selwood had undertaken the whole charge of his education for the two years our parents were to be away, and after that... "'We shall see,' she said. "'She had great ideas about the necessity of giving a boy "'the very best schooling possible, "'but she had not at all the same opinion about girls' education. "'She was a clever woman in some ways, but very old-fashioned. "'Her own upbringing had been at a time "'when very little learning was considered needful "'or even advisable for our sex.' and as she had good practical capacities, and had managed her own affairs sensibly, she always held herself up both in her own mind and to others as a specimen of an unlearned lady who had got on far better than if she had had all the ologies, as she called them, 
at her fingers' ends. This, I think, was one reason why she approved of Miss Ledbury's school, which, as you will hear, was certainly not conducted in accordance with the modern ideas which even then were beginning to make wise parents ask themselves if it was right to spend ten times as much on their son's education as on their daughter's. Teach a girl to write a good hand, to read aloud so that you can understand what she says, to make a shirt and to make a pudding and to add up the butcher's book correctly, and she'll do, Mrs. Selwood used to say. And what about accomplishments? Someone might ask. She should be able to play a tune on the piano and to sing a nice English song or two, if she has a voice, and maybe to paint a wreath of flowers, if her taste lies that way. That sort of thing would do no harm if she doesn't waste time over it. The old lady would allow with great liberality, thinking over her own youthful acquirements, no doubt. I dare say there was a foundation of solid sense in the first part of her advice. I don't see but that girls nowadays might profit by some of it, and in many cases they do. It is quite in accordance with modern thought to be able to make a good many puddings, though homemade shirts are not called for. But as far as the accomplishments go, I should prefer none to such a smattering of them as our old friend considered more than enough. So far, less thought on Mrs. Selwood's part was bestowed on Geraldine, that is, myself, of course, than on Haddon, as regarded the school question, and Mamma had to be guided by Mrs. Selwood's advice to a great extent just then. She had so much to do and so little time to do it in that it would have been impossible for her to go hunting about for school for me, more in accordance with her own ideas, and she knew that personally Miss Ledbury was very well worthy of all respect. She went to see her once or twice to talk about me and make the best arrangements possible. The first of these visits left a pleasanter impression on her mind than the second, for the first time she saw Miss Ledbury alone, and found her gentle and sympathising and full of conscientious interest in her pupils, so that it seemed childish to take objection to some of the rules mentioned by the school mistress in her heart mamma did not approve of one of these was that all the pupils letters were to be read by one of the teachers and as to this miss ledbury said she could make no exception then again no story-books were permitted except such as were read aloud on the sewing afternoons but if i spent my holidays there as was only too probable, this rule should be relaxed. The plan for Sundays, too, struck my mother disagreeably. "'My poor Geraldine,' she said to father, when she was telling him all about it, "'I don't know how she will stand such a dreary day.' Father suggested that I should be allowed to write my weekly letter to them on Sunday, and mother said she would see if that could be." and then father begged her not to look at the dark side of things. After all, he said, Geraldine is very young, and will accommodate herself better than you think to her new circumstances. She will enjoy companions of her own age, too, and we know that Miss Ledbury is a good and kind woman. The disadvantages seem trifling, though I should not like to think the child was to be there for longer than these two years. Mummy gave in to this, indeed there seemed nothing else to do but the second time she went to see miss ledbury the schoolmistress introduced her niece her right hand as she called her a woman of about forty named miss aspinall who though only supposed to be second in command was really the principal authority in the establishment much more than poor old miss ledbury whose health was failing realized herself Mamma did not take to Miss Aspinall, but it was now far too late to make any change, and she tried to persuade herself that she was nervously fanciful. And here, perhaps, I had better say distinctly that Miss Aspinall was not a bad or cruel woman. She was, on the contrary, truly conscientious and perfectly sincere, but she was wanting in all finer feelings and instincts. 
she had had a hard and unloving childhood and had almost lost the power of caring much for any one she loved her aunt after a fashion but she thought her weak she was just or wished to be so and with some of the older pupils she got on fairly well but she did not understand children and took small interest in the younger scholars beyond seeing that they kept the rules and were not complained of by the under teachers who took charge of them and as the younger pupils were very seldom boarders it did not very much matter as they had their own homes and mothers to make them happy once school hours were over mamma did not know that there were scarcely any boarders as young as i for when she first asked about the other pupils miss ledbury thinking principally of lessons said oh yes there was a nice little class just about my age where i should feel quite at home a few days before the day the day of separation for us all mamma took me to see miss ledbury she thought i would feel rather less strange if i had been there once and had seen the lady who was to be my schoolmistress i knew the house green bank it was called by sight it was a little farther out of the town than ours and had a melancholy bit of garden in front and a sort of playground at the back it was not a large house indeed it was not really large enough for the number of people living in it twenty to thirty boarders and a number of day scholars who of course helped to fill the schoolrooms and to make them hot and airless four resident teachers and four or five servants but in those days people did not think nearly as much as now about ventilation and lots of fresh air and perfectly pure water and all such things which we now know to be quite as important to our health as food and clothes mamma rang the bell everything about green bank was neat and orderly prim if not grim so was the maid-servant who opened the door and in answer to mamma's inquiry for miss ledbury showed us into the drawing-room a square moderate-sized room at the right hand of the passage i can remember the look of that room even now perfectly it was painfully neat not exactly ugly for most of the furniture was of the spindle-legged quaint kind to which everybody now gives the general name of queen anne there were a few books set out on the round table there was a cottage piano at one side there were some faint watercolours on the wall and a rather nice clock on the white marble mantelpiece the effect of which was spoilt by a pair of huge lustres as they were called at each side of it the carpet was very ugly large and sprawly in pattern and so was the hearth-rug they were the newest things in the room and greatly admired by miss ledbury and her niece who were full of the bad taste of the day in furniture and would gladly have turned out all the delicate spidery looking tables and chairs to make way for heavy and cumbersome sofas and ottomans but for the question of expense and perhaps for the sake of old association on the elder lady's part there was no fire though it was november and mamma shivered a little as she sat down possibly however not altogether from cold it was between twelve and one in the morning that was the hour at which miss ledbury asked parents to call afterwards when i got to know the rules of her house i found that the drawing-room fire was never lighted except on wednesday and saturday afternoons or on some very special occasion i stood beside mamma somehow i did not feel inclined to sit down i was full of a strange kind of excitement half pleasant half frightening i think the second half prevailed as the moments went on mamma did not speak but i felt her hand clasping my shoulder then at last the door opened end of chapter 4